U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Israel as UNICEF warns of the dire situation of children in Gaza. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arriving in Tel Aviv on Monday evening. He's due to brief Israeli leaders today on his two days of talks with Arab leaders in the region as he attempts to prevent Israel's war against Hamas from exploding into a broader conflict. In New York, the newly appointed UN Humanitarian Reconstruction Coordinator for Gaza, Sigrid Kach, has met with the Secretary General Antonio Guterres. She will facilitate and coordinate humanitarian relief consignments. And UNICEF says it's deeply concerned about the high levels of malnutrition and disease threatening the lives of over one million children in the Palestinian enclave, with cases of diarrhea increasing at an alarming rate. We are here receiving 600,000 doses of routine vaccination. Very, very critical for the life and the well-being of children. We do not want to see children who survive the bombing to die because they are not vaccinated. And in Israel, portraits of the victims of Hamas's deadly 7th of October attack on the tribe of Nova Music Festival. Families have been visiting the site in the Negev desert, where more than 360 people were killed and others were taken hostage. As they walked between the photos and flags, trance music played in the background. Some 3,000 people gathering outside the European Commission office in the Polish capital Warsaw on Monday evening. They were calling on the EU to provide much-needed support and weapons to Ukraine. It was organized by the Euromaiden Warsaw Initiative. Meanwhile, in Berlin, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz called on European Union states to step up support for Ukraine. Wenn so wichtig unser deutscher Beitrag ist, er allein wird nicht ausreichen, um die Sicherheit der Ukraine dauerhaft zu gewährleisten. Ich rufe deshalb die Verbündeten in der Europäischen Union auf, ihre Anstrengungen zugunsten der Ukraine ebenfalls zu verstärken. Die bisher von der Mehrzahl der EU-Mitgliedstaaten geplanten Waffenlieferungen für die Ukraine sind jedenfalls zu gering. And in Ukraine, soldiers in the Kharkiv region have urged the world not to forget their war against Russia. He says they're continuing to fight despite the harsh winter conditions. Il est essentiel qu'en cette année 2024, on défende une Europe solide, robuste, qui protège les citoyens. On voit bien les... President of the European Council, Charles Michel's announcement that he is ending his mandate earlier than expected to run for European elections has raised some eyebrows in Brussels. A prominent Dutch MEP, Sophie Inveld, from the same centrist liberal political family as Michel, wrote on social media that Michel was acting like a captain leaving his ship in the middle of a storm. When asked by Euronews, expert but Alberto Alemano said Michel's decision was selfish. So in a way, this is really terra incognita, is, is a new uh, area, a new space for the European leaders, which Michel is actually doing just to pursue his own self-interest. It's certainly not in the interest of the European Union to have him end his political mandate uh, before his natural term, which would have been November 2024. According to EU law, if a replacement for the EU Council presidency is not found in time, the position will go to whoever is next in rotation. In theory, this could mean the key position could land in the hands of Hungary's Eurosceptic Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who is due to hold the EU's rotating presidency from July. But it appears much more likely that by then, uh, European leaders will have find a replacement. Most likely, in my interpretation, will be a temporary interim replacement, somebody who's going to be cover the natural ending of this mandate of Mr. Michel from, let's say, June to November. And then as a part of the package of the new European top jobs, a new name will be identified. 
Sources close to Charles Michel told journalists that EU leaders could eventually find his successor in June, right after the elections, or they could change the rules to find a successor for the interim period. German farmers blocked the main motorway access roads in some parts of the country on Monday. It's the start of a week of protests against the government plan to eliminate tax benefits for farmers. In Berlin, hundreds of tractors blocked the main access to the Brandenburg Gate. Protests planned for the next seven days include rallies that will disrupt traffic in several regions. Farmers are promising to block the roads for the next eight days despite the German government revising the 2024 budget that sparked these protests in the first place. The changes will see agricultural diesel subsidies reduced over the next two years before ending in 2026, but farmers say this is not enough. Das die Bundesregierung eine, eine, äh, eine Steuererhöhung einseitig gegen die einzige Branche, die weitgehend klimaneutral arbeitet, nämlich die Landwirtschaft, wir nutzen ja die Sonnenenergie hauptsächlich, ähm, verkauft als Abbau von klimaschädlichen Subventionen. Also das ist so abgrundverlogen. The ruling coalition led by Chancellor Olaf Scholz infuriated farmers last month with plans to abolish the car tax exemption for agricultural vehicles and tax breaks on diesel fuel. The snow and extreme cold in Europe continue to complicate life for thousands of citizens throughout the continent, north and south. Sweden recorded minus 43.6 degrees Celsius, its lowest temperature since 1999, while in Denmark temperatures have dropped to minus 20 degrees, causing traffic disruption. This morning, Danish car assistance companies received inquiries from more than 2,000 motorists who needed help. There have been traffic accidents in several places. Snow and sub-zero temperatures on Monday also caused another day of disruption across Moldova, prompting authorities in the capital to close schools and suspend public transport. Police have also warned drivers to take caution after assisting vehicles that veered off the roads amid the icy conditions. Convicted mass murderer Anders Breivik appeared in court on Monday in a second attempt to sue the Norwegian state for allegedly breaching his human rights. Breivik, a right-wing extremist who killed 77 people in a deadly rampage, appeared before a judge in Oslo claiming his solitary confinement since being imprisoned in 2012 amounts to inhumane treatment under the European Convention of Human Rights. A similar claim during a case in 2016 was accepted, but later overturned. On the 22nd of July 2011, Breivik killed eight people in a bomb attack in Oslo before heading to a youth camp on Utoya Island, where, dressed as a police officer, he stalked and gunned down 69 more, mostly teenagers. He has shown no remorse for his attacks, which he portrayed as a crusade against multiculturalism in Norway. In a foreign policy speech on Monday, Pope Francis called for a universal ban on surrogacy, which he called a despicable practice and a serious violation of the dignity of women and children. In his speech, the Pope went on to say a child is a gift that should not be transformed into an object of trafficking and should not be, in his words, the basis of commercial exploitation. The Pope gave the speech on foreign policy to the ambassadors accredited to the Holy See. We have ignition. And lift NASA launched its first rocket to the moon in over 50 years on Monday morning. A new era in spaceflight to the moon and beyond. The Peregrine lander, carried on United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket, is also the first ever launch by a private company. Peregrine has been contracted by NASA to carry five scientific instruments. These will study the Moon's surface environment ahead of human missions later this decade. The buzziest city in the world just got a lot noisier. The tech community is in Las Vegas for CES, the Consumer Electronics Show.
Thousands of tech companies will be spread out across the equivalent of 43 football fields. And the big topic everywhere this year is artificial intelligence, used by this company, which monitors your health via a selfie. Our AI is a big part of this. So we're actually using what we call effective AI. Effective AI, what we're doing is we're taking physiological and psychological biomarkers, and we're using that to basically understand your health condition in real time. AI is also being used in space. The AI is uh, very important because since we are working, first of all, with the astronauts, um, the AI is going to collect the data. Our main and huge uh, step is that we are preparing an AI as a psychologist for astronauts for Mars. Back on Earth, governments are trying to wrangle how to regulate AI to protect our data. What we're advocating for in the United States, because we are a US Canadian organization, is that we need to be Goldilocks with the three bears. The porch has to be just right. You have to balance privacy against innovation. We have to welcome change, we have to be willing to pivot, and those companies and countries which do that will be the winners. The CES will also showcase all the latest gadgets, from the world's first ski skates to the tech you take home. This massager is not just massaging the body, but it also strengthens my core because it has the first technology to move my two legs independently. Such technology will be widely available at CES this year, which expects to see 130,000 attendees. This is Pascal Davies reporting for Euronews in Las Vegas.